All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, and welcome to the 14th annual ESQ Career Symposium. Uh, my name is Mitchell Brunson, co-president of the Business Law Society. And on behalf of my co-presidents, Ashley Wade and Devin McLaughlin, and the entire BLS board, uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight for this very special event. This symposium offers an invaluable opportunity for Duke Law students to interact with legal and business practitioners from around the country and learn firsthand about the variety of career paths available to them after graduating from Duke Law. First and foremost, the Business Law Society would like to thank all the visiting professionals who have for their generosity and time and coming to share their experiences and giving back to the next generation of Duke Law graduates. So please join me in giving a round of applause to all our practitioners. Planning this event takes a tremendous amount of time and effort, and we have a lot of support from the Duke administration. Um, we'd like to extend a special thank you to the Career and Professional Development Center, the Office of Alumni Development, the Events Office, and the Media Services for all their help organizing this event. Without their support and time, this would not be possible. We would also like to thank our sponsors, um, Simpson Thatcher, Sullivan and Cromwell, Cadwallader, Cravath, k &L Gates, Paul Weiss, and Weil. Your generosity in funding this symposium is very much appreciated. Thank you. As I mentioned, the goals of the Business Law Society, and specifically this symposium, are to show students the wide variety of career paths their legal education offers them, and to help them begin to build their own unique career. Now, while the legal job market has certainly recovered from its post-recession depths, an uncertain economic outlook remains across the globe and ensures that the landscape will continue to change and remain highly competitive. This is going to require a new blend of old and new job hunting skills, techniques, and outlooks to get ahead. Research suggests that the average millennial will switch jobs every two years throughout their entire career. Our speaker this evening has a lot of experience dealing with change. Ms. Lin Chua has worked in three continents and speaks five languages, including Mandarin and Dutch. She was born and raised in Singapore. Growing up in a small but cosmopolitan country, Ms. Chua seized the opportunity at age 18 to follow the footsteps of her father some 30 years before when he was one of the first pioneer Asian scholars in Australia. She graduated with honors with degrees in accounting, economics, and law from the University of Sydney. Several years later, she received her LLM degree from Duke University. Ms. Chua's legal career as a transactional lawyer has taken her to the top tier law firms around the globe, Simpson Thatcher in New York, DeBraw in Amsterdam, and Free Hills in Sydney. She has represented her clients, which include private equity funds, financial institutions, and corpora corporations on a variety of matters. These include M&A, capital markets, and structured finance. During her three years in Amsterdam, to better relate to her clients and Dutch friends and peers, Lynn's efforts at mastering the Dutch language even equipped her to advise her clients in Dutch. And yet another big swing several years later, Ms. Chua responded to an invitation to leave private practice in the Netherlands and return to the US. She joined GE Capital to help start their new global trade finance business, an area which until then she had little to no experience in. By the time she left, the unit managed over $10 billion in assets. When the credit crisis came around several, several years later, she adapted once again. She played an integral role in helping transform the unit, helping GE Capital set up a new capital markets business. During her time at GE, she has negotiated several key transactions and has managed teams across the globe. In 2015, she took yet another bold step, leaving GE Capital after nearly a decade to co-found Internext Capital, a fintech lender for businesses. Lawyer, banker, entrepreneur, and Duke alum, Ms. Chua not only embraces change, she thrives in it. So please help me welcome Ms. Lin Chua. Well, Mitchell, <clears throat> thank you very much for that. That nearly paid and reimbursed me for my flight from New York to Durham. <laughs> But seriously, every year I'm here, I'm amazed at the quality of students that Duke Law produces. And Mitch, for example, when we talked about what we should talk about at the intro this evening, I asked him a bit about himself after I'd gone on this long-winded story about my startup and my business. And I learned in that conversation that he himself had worked in a startup and he had managed a division of reinsurers. 
So you guys are a wonderful crowd. Let's start with that and be very proud of yourself and what you're about to embark on. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about my business, the industry I'm in, and then to share with you some of the tips and nuggets that I have been very blessed to have received from various mentors and sponsors throughout my career. So starting with that, um, let me go into FinTech, a term that some of you may know, many probably have heard of. And what, what is FinTech? Technological Innovation and Finance. Technologi technology, finance, that makes sense, FinTech. Finance is not new. It's one of the oldest industries in the world, as we, we know. Technology, too, in itself isn't a new concept and technological innovations is not new. So why now, why FinTech? Because FinTech is about an exponential change in te technological innovation and finance. And why now? For a few reasons. Internet and mobile revolution. One, two, legacy systems in banks and traditional financial institutions. And after the recent crisis, significant, com significant compliance costs. So put those two together, what do you have? A renaissance for technological innovation, and that's what FinTech is about. And the most exciting thing about it is that it's only in its infant stage. So before I go further, um, maybe two quotes. Probably the most famous one, JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon caution shareholders in 2014 that Silicon Valley is coming. And he meant, what did he mean by that? He meant that startups and innovation and entrepreneurs were gonna be transforming the finance industry. And why startups? Why can't it happen in a big company? Of course it can. I worked to start up a business in GE Capital, a big company, I called myself an entrepreneur. So why, why does it have to be in a small startup? Because startups are just more conducive to innovation and change. Because they're not bogged down with legacy systems, with old processes that you have to overcome, discuss, talk about. There's just much more of an appetite to deal with new things. Goldman Sachs estimates that 4.7 trillion in revenue, that's 470 billion in profits, from the traditional banking marketplace is at risk of being displaced by FinTech. So with that said, um, I want you guys to look out for Larry Baxter's course that he's gonna be doing this spring semester called FinTech and the Law. I am so proud and impressed that Duke is already embracing that and putting that on the books for you guys. I highly encourage you to take that course. So a little bit about my business, Internex Capital. We are a specialty asset-based finance company. Let me have that sink in, lots of words in that. Specialty asset-based lending company that is digital and online. And we provide funding to small businesses. So we lend to small businesses. Um, our product is basically short-term revolving lines of credit. So I know there's a lot of information in that for you guys. But think of it simply as we're a digital lender that lends to small businesses using a particular type of product that is short-term and revolving. And we use technology in that. I'll get to that in a second. Our management team comprises myself and some of my former GE Capital colleagues. In addition, we have some FinTech entrepreneurs in there. And last but not least, we have as a strategic investor, Jampack, which is a New York Stock Exchange listed technolo technology company that is helping us accelerate our technology build. So you heard me talk about, talk about the lending part and where's, where's the Where's the technology part, in the FinTech in it? And we use technology primarily in two ways. The first way, we use it to provide our customers with a frictionless experience, with a better experience. They have a better time lending. What does that mean? Think of the travel agents of the earlier generation. In the mid-90s, there were 34,000 locations where there were travel agencies in the mid-90s. There's less than one-third of them around today. 
When was the last time you went into a travel agent to book a direct flight from one location to, an, to another? And now transfer that to lending. Traditionally, people walk in to a regional bank for a small business to get a small business loan. They fill in forms. They PDF their tax forms. They go back, they have more conversations. And just like the travel agent, several visits, several days later, and then six, eight, sometimes four months of underwriting later, they get a response, many times disappointed. That's what we're here to transform. We're trying to transform how lending happens in the marketplace. And we're very excited about it. And that in itself isn't new. There are digital lenders out there. Some of you may have heard of Lending Club. Others may have heard of Prosper on deck. How we think we're different is that we're using technology not only to improve customer experience, but in another way, we're using algorithms to also manage the portfolio. Because we're doing a short-term loan as opposed to a long-term loan, so it's a short-term revolving facility, that data management that we have from our customer is ongoing. So come the next credit cycle, our investors are holding loans that we are repeatedly monitoring and looking at real-time data and managing. And that's the unique difference, differentiator that we bring to the marketplace that we're very excited about. We launch our product in the second quarter of next year. This year, I'm sorry. We launch our product in the second quarter of, next, of this year. <laughs> So moving away from my business and maybe taking it to Durham, North Carolina, 20 years ago, I was having margaritas at Cosmic Cantina. Do people still do that? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm standing here talking to you guys. And what's your journey going to be 20 years from now? And that's what this weekend is about. What's your journey going to be and how are you going to define your path? So I'm here to share again now the rest of it, some nuggets that I got along the way. Um, I've been very lucky to have many, ben to have many, many sponsors and, and mentors that have helped me. And I will tell you that a lot of them are Duke alums. So I'll start off by saying the biggest nugget I can give you is built your Duke network quickly with the alums, find your mentors, find your professors. They will become your mentors in life and in your profession. And they have been mine and I'm still very grateful to till this day. So going through some of those, and I'll mention too that some of these are not lessons I learned from mentors. Some of these are lessons I learned the hard way through failure. And hopefully when you see them, you'll take some away and and learn it a little easier than I did. So, number one, embrace the unknown. When you choose what you're doing, I like to say, always ensure that you find something where you know you're gonna be learning. And that might seem really obvious, but sometimes we forget that after we focus on all the other items that we want, such as finance, how much are they paying me, location, convenience, what the people are like. And all of those things are important, but you need to ask yourself, ask your mission statement, am I going to be learning something out of this role? And keep on asking yourself that at every interval, every six months, every year. What am I still learning from it? I like to think of that scale that people talk about between anxiety and boredom that you may have heard about. And the best place to place yourself is somewhere tilted towards anxiety, not at the end. We don't want a mental breakdown. <laughs> but certainly not towards boredom. And somewhere there, that's where you want to be in your career. That's what keeps you excited because you're, you're stretched. It's a little difficult, maybe a little hard. But you're interested, you're excited, and you work at it. Face into that uncertainty and embrace it. One of the reasons that uh, I left GE Capital to join Internext was because 
I was very excited that I found something that gave me the opportunity to value add based on the experiences I brought to the table. But it also scared me because there was so much stretch in it, because it was so new, because I had to innovate, because I had to truly solve problems without examples that I could just cut and paste from. And I urge you to always constantly ask yourself, are you given the opportunity in whatever role you choose to go into to do that? And are you create, creating the opportunity for yourself to do that? And that's the, really the same for your career in general. Sometimes we think, and I know I used to think, that your career can be a straight line. And that you can plan exactly what you want to do, and it will happen that way. And the reality is that life does not happen that way. Things happen in your life, in your relationships, in your career that you can't plan for. And use that opportunity to face into it. When I started um, my, well, when I continued my legal career after leaving Duke, Duke I joined Simpson Thatcher. And I had a fantastic time there. I trained with some of the smartest brains at Simpson Thatcher. And I would never have guessed at that point in time when I was feeling like a, a master of the universe, a mistress of the universe. That, that just that sounds wrong, but anyway. <laughs> um, that I would ever leave Simpson. But I ended up falling in love with a Dutch man and moved to Amsterdam. So life happens. And be prepared for that uncertainty and be prepared to flex through that change. And that change will bring you to places that you may not have expected. And that's OK. That's OK. Because you're going to find your way, and you're going to draw, draw your own path. And that's, that's the fun part about it. Um, one thing to keep in mind as you chart your path is be prepared to take risks. I frequently hear people say, whenever they're taking a big swing, that it's really risky. And are you sure you, someone should do that because of all the risks you take? And that's fine. It is really good to consider the risks involved in any decisions. But I think the one risk people always forget to take into account is the risk of not doing anything at all. And that's whether you are you, the student sitting in your chair, whether you are a practitioner sitting where you are, have you considered what happens if you're not doing anything at all? What is the risk in that? And put that alongside all your other options as you're considering them and weigh them in the same way you would as well. Next um, nugget that I've gotten when I hit G Capital with a big force was get comfortable with numbers. I'm going to repeat that because of the room of people that we have here. Get comfortable with numbers. And I don't mean go take a course. That's not enough. Get comfortable with numbers and really start defining your goals using metrics. And I know that's not always obvious, particularly when you go towards a law firm career path, where you think, well, hang on a sec. That's more about substance and strategy than numbers. But I'll tell you, I don't believe in that. If you can't measure something, you can't manage it. Give it a number so that you can align your goals to what you're trying to achieve, and you can manage and drive yourself towards it. If your firm or your company does not give you a metric to measure yourself against, if your boss doesn't do it, create it yourself. Ask if you're at a law firm each client that you've worked with at the end on a scale of 1 to 10 what number they would give you, what we call the net promoter score. Just ask them, even as an associate, ask your counterpart associate that you work with on the other side, what score would they give you? Now mark yourself on that over five deals and look at your trajectory of your net promoter score. How are you faring? I'm just raising an example. There are many other ways that you can rank your performance, align yourself to the goals of the organization or your own mission statements for what you want to achieve in your career, and track yourself and measure yourself on it. So get comfortable with those numbers. Um, networking mentors, sponsors, we've all heard about those. But they're so important that I feel I have to throw it out there once more. 
Um, the, a lesson I learned perhaps somewhat later in life is that your competence and your connections have an inverse relationship. So the more senior you grow in your career, the less important it is how well you do at your work than who you know. That probably sounds obvious, but I don't know if I personally took it on as obviously as I should have. And I guess my, my nugget that I'll give to you is that happens way faster than I had expected it to be. People want to work with people they trust, they like, and they know. And you only need a year or two to demonstrate your competence. You have to start making them like you from the start and work the rest of the way to make sure they like you. So build on that relationship. It's going to become more important than the good work you do at the table way faster than you think. And on the networking point, back to Duke again, this is a great community, a very trusting community that takes care of each other. I encourage you to use it. Um, mentors. Mentors and sponsors. Um, I have my own personal board of directors. I know a lot of other people use that concept. Um, so that's not a new concept, but I probably what I want to share with you on that front is perhaps a hard lesson I learned myself. Um, I always thought sponsors and mentors were about the people around you who would support you in that juncture of the career where you were at that point in time. So when I hit GE Capital, I rose very quickly at the start. Incredibly, I had the support of very senior leadership at the business. When the economy turned, that framework changed very quickly. I lost a lot of my sponsors, some of them overnight. They were moved, they went to a different division. Some of them left the company altogether. And in my own case, that was a promotion I actually thought I would get that I didn't. So the lesson I took away from that was that, yes, I had built my sponsorship and mentor relationships, but I was too selective in what I built. I only thought of the single one step I was in, and I didn't think about the bigger steps and the next step and the steps after that. So think wide, think deep as you build those relationships. And don't just think about the people that you think, oh, he's not or she's not in my field. They're not going to be helpful in guiding me. Many times I've been wrong in thinking that. Everyone offers something to you, and you can offer something to that next person. So build that community of support and help people back, because that is that network that's going to be helping you. Um, and on networking, the other tidbit that, that I work hard on and I'm not great with is um, not just starting that intro, but staying in touch. So don't just build a connection, but work at keeping in touch. And that is an incredibly hard thing to do. And I'd like to share a tip that someone dear to me does that I, that I admire and I wish I did more of. Um, instead of writing, doing, you know, doing a big lunch or regular coffees or long emails to the people he wants to keep in touch with, this person would, in his daily life, whenever he reads an email that's interesting or he's seen a movie that's good, he would forward it to that person someone else, whoever it might be. And using that little step, he would connect with six to 10 people a day without a second thought. And those little snippets of contact that he has, be it two to three times a year with one person, is more valuable than the big lunch I might have taking that same person out. So keep in touch. It doesn't have to be a lot, but regularity is key. And I struggle, and I work hard at it. I urge you to work hard at it, too. Um, the next tidbit comes from a book some of you may have read by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. 
and it's called Sharpen Your Saw. And as the name suggests, spend time taking care of yourself. That is your physical, your health, your social, emotional, that is your connections, your family, your friends, your mental, whether you're learning, growing, and lastly, spiritual, to be defined by yourself. And all of us need to do more of that. The bit that I like about this tidbit is that we all do too little of it. How many times have we heard someone say, I'm too busy to do this because I've got all this work to do? I'm too busy to do that because I've got to get this done by tonight. I know I'm always guilty of that. But remember, each time that you're doing that, you're the woodcutter that's chopping away at that tree with your blunt saw. So take time to sharpen your saw because it would make you better at your work. And what I, the one thing that I do religiously every year, and I think everyone has their way of sharpening their saw, I'm proud to say that from the start of my career till now, there has not been a single year where I have not taken the full allocated vacation that's granted to me by my employer. I encourage you to do the same. <laughs> um, failure. How failure shapes you. And this is a tough one, and it's a very personal one. But failure is very powerful. I know when I look at hiring people, I like those with scar tissue, because you learn a lot. There's no other better way to learn than from failure. Before I joined Duke, I was an attorney in Australia, and I knew I wanted to work in New York City. It had become my dream at that point in time. It was what I wanted to do. I'd applied to a host of law firms in New York City. I came over. And through the various contacts I'd made, I'd interview with these firms. I was rejected at every single place. By the time I started Duke, two weeks into my time here, I had my applications out to every single law firm that was in the NELP book because I'd failed before. So sh failure shapes you. It shapes me. So don't look at the times that you've failed, that you've gotten rejection as the time for you to turn away and say, I'm not good enough. Use it to energize you to do even more and to do even better and to reflect on how you can make it right the next time around. And don't be embarrassed of your failures. Carry them like a badge you should be proud of. As long as you let yourself learn from it, you can only grow from it. I have a lot more stories of failures, but we can talk about them outside. <laughs> <By> the <way. laughs> um, so looking at the time, you guys are here. You have tonight, you have a great team of practitioners here to network with. You have a great session of many panels tomorrow. And there's probably a lot going through your head. What are you going to try to get out of this? Who are you going to try to meet? Um, I just want you to keep a couple of things in mind as you go through the day, the evening and the day. And part of it is about choices, figuring out what you want to do. I urge you to be intentional in your choices. And as we talked about in the beginning, I mean that by thinking about which are the roles that you'll take away the most from, that you'll learn the most from, personally, and where you think it would take you for the next role after that. What is your mission statement in wanting to be with a particular place? Is that because you like that area of the law? Because you want to train with the best lawyers? Because you want to be in the geography? Whatever the reason may be, articulate it for yourself. But retain flexibility, because remember, as we talked about at this, side, at this front, be prepared that there's going to be change. There will be uncertainty. And there'll be factors you don't think about, the market, personal life, others. And be prepared to flex with it, because life's not a straight line. And the same, for that same reason, come tonight, come tomorrow, do not expecting that you're going to get the perfect answer on this is what you should do, and this is where you should apply for, 
and this is how you should do it. You have to look within yourself to find your own path that will take you to your cosmic cantina, to wherever you're going to be in the future. Define it for yourself. And my last point is, let me, let me, let me do this through, through my own story. Um, when I was deciding to leave GE Capital, I was considering between, um, luckily, a, a few options. And one of them was a traditional role, a promotion from where I was at GE Capital, a bigger role in another, another big corporation. And long story short, I was sitting at dinner. I was having um, one of my, my discussions with someone who I'll call a mentor. And by the way, he's a Duke alum. Um, and I was going through the pros and cons of each of the different offers. And we spent about an hour over dinner talking about them. And he was silent the whole time. And at a point in time when I was finally done rattling off all my pros and cons of each item. This person turned to me and said, look, Lynn, you've been you, true to self. You've been methodical, analytical. You have laid down the pros and cons of each. You've even put a, a, a number, a metric, next to each pros and cons so that you had a weighted average number at the bottom for each choice so you knew your, your, your decision. And you're very analytical. But what I haven't heard from you is probably the most important thing, which is what do you want to do yourself? And that's something that's probably very obvious to all of you guys sitting here, because that's probably the number one thing you guys are thinking about sitting in your chair, what do I want to do? And what I ask you now is to bottle up that feeling. Because 20 years from now, if you were to lose it, you can open that bottle, write it down, Email it to yourself, whatever it may be, but bottle it up. Because you've got to love what you want to do. You've got to love your job. You spend three quarters of your waking hours doing it. You need to be passionate about it. So I'm going to close with that. Len, thank you so much for coming to, to share with us. And I think I speak for everyone when I say I'm fascinated to hear more of your stories throughout the weekend. Before we go downstairs to Star Commons, I'd just like to remind everyone that check-in starts at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Yes, 8 o'clock. Um, but with that, let's, let's go downstairs and do some of that networking that Len just talked about. <laughs>